Okay. Well, welcome back. We have, we started last week uh, on our new presentations about Ozark's history. And uh, again, I hope you'll stay with me. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, if you're from or around the Ozarks, some of this may be more familiar to you than those that are away. But if you're away from the Ozarks, it's an opportunity to learn something new about a region which really isn't that well known throughout the United States. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, so today, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about just exactly where and what the Ozarks are. Uh, a lot of people, you know, it's kind of out there, but they don't really know. But we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about the, the water resources of the Ozarks. If there's one thing that defines the Ozarks, it's the water and the land. Uh, it's so unique. In the United States that, and I think what you'll see this week and the next couple of weeks, you're going to understand that better if you don't know anything about it. One thing I thought I'd do, uh, again, since the Ozarks is kind of a new area for a, a lot of you, I thought I'd start each presentation off with spotlighting an individual that either is from the Ozarks or has deep connections in one way or another to the Ozarks. And this is my first person. I'm just curious out there uh, I know there's not even really any good way for me to tell, but I'm curious if any, any of you might recognize this person. He's obviously sitting on a riverbank doing some drawing. Uh, and who this is, is Thomas Hart Benton. He is probably the most famous painter to come out of the Ozarks. Uh, he was a uh, world-renowned artist in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Uh, he painted in what is generally called the kind of a post-impressionistic style. He got his training at Chicago Art Institute, went on to Paris and studied there during the, the lost generation years that we hear so much about. Uh, came back to the United States and uh, had a prolific career uh, painting and uh, very, very well-known artist worldwide. His uh, paintings command millions of dollars today. So thought it'd be interesting to maybe share with you uh, somebody famous from the Ozarks every week. Uh, maybe not so famous in cases. Okay, so Ozarks. Where in the world did we get the name Ozarks? Most place names, when you look out here and you see place names, they're either came to us from another language, maybe Indian, uh, Native American, maybe British, uh, French, German. You know, the Ozarks is not like that. Uh, the Ozarks is a kind of a homegrown name. In fact, there really isn't a definitive answer exactly where the Ozarks got its name. Uh, there's a lot of debate out there about it. So let's look at four of the possibilities. Uh, probably the most commonly accepted is that it was a derivative of the French O Arkansas which means at the bend of the Arkansas River. Uh, and most people assume that the Ozarks got its name during the French occupation of the Ozarks in the 1700s. Uh, that's when it began to be called the Ozarks. Uh, some people think it's really a derivative of the French O-Arcs, which means Indian bow, because uh, as we will see, the Native American tribe that occupied the Ozarks during the French period of time was the Osage Indians. And the Osage Indians were famous for their bows. Uh, they made them out of the hedge apple tree, the Boa de Arc, the Osage Arc. And some people think that the Ozarks is kind of a derivative of that. Here's my guess. And I've read this and I think it's probably, probably correct. The French were notorious record keepers, and we know that they abbreviated a lot of what they wrote. And so during the records that was sent back to France, a lot of them refer to as the land of the O's and the Arcs, the Osage and the Arkansas Indians. And if you look at that, it makes sense. O's and Arcs sounds very familiar, uh, sounds like Ozarks. And of course, Ozarkers are notorious for, uh, you know, using terms and 
uh, mispronouncing them in the typical way they're supposed to be pronounced. There's a little town not long, not far from here called Boyd Ark. And everybody in the Ozark calls it Boat Ark. So, you know, I can see how the land of the Olds and Arks got transferred to Ozarks really rapidly. But that's some possibilities. Again, nobody really knows for sure. All I know is that they use these terms quite frequently in their, in their publicizing uh, things. Here is a, a famous winery down in Altus, Arkansas, um, Chateau O'Ark. And by the way, if you don't know, the Ozarks is uh, one of the biggest wine producing areas in the world. Um, the land of the Ozarks is very much similar to the lands of the wine, uh, wine areas in southern France. So there's a, there's a reason why that, that is uh, so. So where are the Ozarks? Well, it covers about 50,000 square miles. And again, not everybody agrees with the borders of the Ozarks because there's no you know, particular border, but we kind of know the region. Uh, it's composed primarily of states. Uh, of Missouri, by far and away the largest amount, 33,000 square miles approximately. Arkansas has about 13,000 square miles in the northern part of Arkansas. Uh, Oklahoma surprisingly has a, a fairly sizable little area on the very eastern edge of Arkansas in an area known as the Cookson Hills of Oklahoma. And there's even geographically a little section of Illinois on the other side of the Mississippi River. Now, I can guarantee you, if you go to Illinois and you tell them they live in their part of the Ozarks, they would flat out run you across the river. Nobody would believe that they were in the Ozarks in Illinois. But there is a geographically, there's a little section of land, uh, about a thousand square miles, that geographically is often called part of the Ozarks. Size-wise, it's about the same size as the state of Ohio. I know I've got some listeners back there in, uh, in Ohio. So the Ozarks is about the same size as your state. And so here's an idea. Here's a map that shows you the Ozarks uh, superimposed upon uh, these four states. And you can see there's uh, most of it by far and away is in Missouri, uh, the north northern part, northwestern part of Arkansas, the Cooks and Hills of Oklahoma, and there's just a really little section over here in Illinois that classifies as being part of the Ozarks geographically. So the shape of the Ozarks, well, I just showed you a map. It kind of looks like a parallelogram. Uh, it, in, geometrically, it looks like that. It's bordered on all four sides, not totally, but you, know, you, can, you can look at it and see the rivers uh, by major rivers. Uh, the Missouri River borders it to the north, the Mississippi and the Black Rivers to the east, the Arkansas and the White Rivers to the south, and finally the Grand, the Neosho and the Osage to the west. So again, here's another map, and you can see the same diagram, only this time it's larger, and you can see the rivers. This is the Missouri River. This is the Mississippi River. This is the Black River here. Uh, the White River runs up this way. The Arkansas River this way. And here's the Grand River and then the Osho River and the Osage River up here. So that's kind of the borders of the Ozarks. Now, you'll notice that the Ozarks has a lot of rivers. And that's what we're gonna talk about now for the next few minutes is the water. Uh, I cannot tell you how important the water and the land is in the Ozarks. It's a, there's a certain, what I call a synergy to the two. And if you understand the history of the Ozarks and the culture of the Ozarks, you gotta look back and look at the water and the land because it had a profound effect upon the development of the region. Uh, we are just absolutely rich in water resources. Uh, one thing we very seldom have to worry about is drought. Now, sometimes in the summer months, July and August, when we don't have any rain for some time, you know, sometimes it will start to get dry and we, we have had droughts, 
But for the most part, droughts are not a real problem because we have a huge amount of surface waters. Uh, we have several lakes because they've impounded some of these rivers and made lakes. Uh, so very seldom is, is the lack of water a real problem in the Ozarks. Now, the land's a different story. Uh, and we're going to talk about this next week. The land of the Ozarks, well, let me tell you this. There's a county right to the south of here called Stone County. And I tell people they don't call it Stone County for nothing. Uh, it is not good land. There are pockets of land in the Ozarks around the Springfield area and out to the east around the Salem area that, are, that have good agricultural land. But for the most part, the Ozarks is not your tr traditional agricultural area. Uh, they can produce a lot of hay. Uh, they can herd cattle, uh, hogs, chickens, things like that. But as far as uh, planting huge row crops, there's not just a whole lot of that going on in the Ozarks because, frankly, the soil is not that good. What the land does provide is a natural barrier. And that's part of the reasons why the Ozarks has always been such a remote region, still is today. I mean, where I'm living in Springfield, it's a huge metropolitan city now of a quarter of a million people. But you can go 15, 20 miles from here, and there's no saying in the Ozarks, you can't get there from here. I mean, it's, it's really remote, real rapidly in parts of the Ozarks. Um, I was taking a little driving around uh, just something my wife and I do a lot of times, you know, just to get out of our facility and, and drive a little bit. And I tell her I like to get lost. Well, it wasn't that many weeks ago that I took a little drive and I literally got lost. And I said, Jan, I have no idea where I'm at. Uh, my phone didn't work because I was out of cell. Uh, and I mean, it, I just finally turned north because I knew if I drove north far enough, I would surely hit some road that I would recognize. And I finally did after about a half an hour. But uh, I was really down in some pretty remote, rugged territory. And uh, it's really easy still to get lost in the Ozarks. So let's talk about these rivers, streams, and springs a little bit. Uh, like I said, they played a central role in the Ozarks uh, when these settlers first chose to settle in the Ozarks in the 1830s and on. Um, I've often wondered what brought my great, great, great grandpa John to the Ozarks in 1843. He and uh, several of his children uh, who had their own families by then came here from Kingston, Tennessee, um, south of, uh, <laughs> okay, I forgot there uh, for a minute, but it's out right near the Tennessee River. And uh, they, uh, they traveled here in 1843. And I often wonder what brought them here. I'm almost positive it was the water. Because, you know, again, water is really important to people that farm. And that was the major thing. Now, we're blessed, as I've said, with lots of water. You think about it. The two biggest rivers, the two biggest rivers in the United States formed the northern and the eastern boundaries of the Ozarks, the Mississippi and the Missouri. Uh, Mississippi is about 2,320 miles long, and the Missouri is 2,341 miles long. Uh, they're the two largest rivers in the United States. On top of that, the Ohio River joins the Mississippi River at Missouri. So the three largest rivers in the United States all form boundaries of the Ozarks in one way or the other. And it was these rivers where the first settlers in Missouri and later on into the Ozarks first came because that's obviously the best land. It was alluvial soil and uh, you could plant huge crops there. Uh, the area up around the Missouri River that runs through the central part of Missouri uh, during the uh, antebellum period before the Civil War was known as Little Dixie. And uh, the reason was because they could grow so much crops there compared to, to the rest of the state. So here's kind of a picture. I'm going to have a lot of photographs for you to look at. A lot of pretty pictures. This is the Mississippi River, uh, by far and away the biggest river. The Missouri is actually a little longer, but it's not nearly as large 
in capacity as the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River drains the whole central part of the United States. Uh, so there's the Mississippi River. The Missouri River uh, is not as deep or nor as wide. It's a little bit longer, but uh, it's not as big in that way as is the Mississippi River. It's also a lot muddier. Uh, nickname for the Missouri River is Big Muddy because it, it drains a lot of the alluvial soil from the Great Plains and uh, it silts over really bad. It's also a pretty dangerous river, uh, actually more dangerous than Mississippi River to navigate uh, because of the whirlpools and things like that. And then of course, there's the Ohio River. This is where the Ohio River uh, joins the Mississippi River in Missouri. This is the Mississippi and this is the Ohio here. And they come together uh, down in the very southeastern part of the state. So that's the three big rivers, but they're on the edges of the Ozarks. So what about the rivers that are inside the Ozarks? Well, there's at least 11 that you could classify as big rivers, you know, actual rivers. There's the Osage River, named after the Indian tribe that, that lived on it during the first settlement of the white people. There's the Gasconade River, the Merrimack, the White River, which flows in southern, uh, northern Arkansas and up through southern Missouri, the Eleven Point River, the Current River, the Black River, the St. Francis River, the Buffalo River, which is uh, probably one of the best known of the rivers because it's a nat nationally protected river now. It's called, it's actually called a National River and the Neosho and of course the Arkansas, which is also a huge river. So let me show you a map here. Yeah, this again kind of shows you some idea about these rivers. And if you start up here, of course, this is the Missouri River and this is the Mississippi River and then the, the Ohio comes into it down here, the very Southeastern part. Uh, up here is the Osage River. The Osage River has been dammed. Uh, in four different spots. And they made lakes out of the Osage River for the most part. The Gasconade River starts down here around Springfield and flows up all the way into the Mississippi. Uh, the Merrimack River starts down here and flows all the way up the drains in the Mississippi. You've got the St. Francis River, which comes all the way down here and eventually drains into the Arkansas River. You can't see it because it doesn't show it there. You got the Black River, the Current River, the Eleven Point River, and all these drain into the White River and eventually into the Arkansas River. Uh, this is the Arkansas River here. It flows like this. This is the Buffalo River, which is a beautiful river, very, very well protected river. This is the White River. The White River has also been dammed on about five different locations. And they've made uh, huge lakes down here for the tourist industry and also to provide uh, rural electrification. Uh, this is the Neosho and the Spring River and up in this area through here. So that will give you an idea of the major rivers. You can see there's some really, they're, they're really pretty good sized rivers. Here's the Buffalo River. It's not that big, but as you can see, it's absolutely a beautiful river. Um, you know, and uh, it's, it's one of those rivers that people come from thousands of miles to float uh, and partake in the majestic scenery. Uh, this is the Osage River, what's left of it. Most of it has been dammed and impounded, but there are still parts of it that, that flow free. And this is, uh, this is some of the Osage River, very pretty good sized river. Now, besides those rivers, there's also rivers that I prefer to call streams because they're not quite as big, um, they're not quite as long, and they, they don't provide as much water. Most of them have not been dammed. Uh, most of them ha don't have any impoundments on them, and uh, they're a lot smaller, but they're still yet uh, important because actually they're the rivers that many of the interior settlements were first settled on. There's something called the Jacks Fork River, the North Fork River, the James River, which flows just right south of me, about two miles from here, Beaver Creek, Spring River, the Big Piney River, the Little Piney River, 
the Sac River and the Pomme de Terre River. If you're in the Ozarks, it's called Pomme de Terre. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we, uh, we don't do very good at pronouncing things. And there's the Niagara River. And again, here's another map, kind of shows you some of these rivers here. Here's the Niagara, flows into the Osage. Here's the James River, but flows through Greene County down and flows into Table Rock. Uh, the Jack's Fork isn't shown on here, but it's right here in Shannon County. Uh, there's the Big Piney and the Little Piney isn't shown really here. And uh, over here is the Sac River and uh, some of the other smaller rivers. You can see that the Ozarks just has an abundance of rivers. I mean, there's just all over the place. Now, as I said, some of these rivers vary. This is the James River. It's not a real big river. In fact, case this was taken at flood stage during the, one of the floods that we have here on occasion. As you can see, it's just, it's not that big a river. Um, it also is fairly highly polluted because for many, many years, Springfield didn't do a very good job of uh, uh, protecting its natural water resources. They're doing a much better job today. And uh, the river has cleaned up a lot, but it's still not your crystal clear river. For instance, look at this river. This is the North Fork River that flows down the southeastern part of the Ozark. Um, now, that is extremely deceptive because as you look at that picture, you think you're probably looking at a river that's probably maybe two at the most, three foot deep. Don't kid yourself, folks. I floated the North Fork River and the river is a lot deeper than it looks because it is absolutely clear, crystal pure. And it's a very, it and the Jack's Fork together are two of the most preserved river in the Ozarks. In 1818, a man by the name of Henry Rose Schoolcraft came to the Ozarks. He's the first real explorer of the Ozarks to write down about it and kind of explore the Ozarks. There were people living here, a few rough settlers and all, but for the most part, no one had ever really explored all the Ozarks and had not really written about it. He wrote about it. He wrote a, a book, a journal, it's called uh, it's been republished recently called Rude Pursuits and Rugged Peaks. And uh, I've read it several times, but I thought I'd kind of read you a description of that river I just showed you, the uh, North Fork. Listen to what he said, because it's, it's true today. The stream, the North Fork, which we are pursuing is devious beyond all example and is further characterized by being made up wholly of springs. We have passed one of these springs today, the Topaz River, which preserves, deserves to be ranked amongst the natural phenomena of this region. It rushes out of an aperture in a limestone rock at least 50 yards across, and where it joins the main river, the waters possess the purity of crystal. It is so clear, white, and transparent that the stones and pebbles at the bottom, at a depth of eight to 10 feet, are reflected through it with the most perfect accuracy as the color, size, and position, and at the same time appear as if within two or three feet of the surface of the water. In attempting to ford the river where the water appeared to be two or three foot deep, the horse was suddenly plunged in below its depth and was compelled to swim across by which baggage, which our baggage got completely wetted. Wet. That's the Norfolk River. Now, during the 1930s and 40s, the Army Corps of Engineers began damming up some of these rivers, particularly the White River. And people began to be scared that they were going to dam up some of these really beautiful, pristine rivers in the Ozarks. So there was a movement to protect some of these rivers. And in 1964, I remember very well when this happened, President Lyndon Johnson signed what was called the Ozark National Scenic Rivers Way Act, which was designed to protect the natural state of two of these rivers, the Current and the Jacks Fork. And they are still federally protected rivers. They can never be dammed. Uh, the National Park Service has a right to acquire private property, and they have pretty much acquired all the property along the banks uh, make, to make sure that there's no big 
buildings or anything like that built. And for the most part, when you go down one of these rivers, you don't see anything. In 1972, the Buffalo River was declared a national river to protect it from impoundment as well. So these three rivers exist today in a pretty much their natural state. And you can go down one of these rivers on a float trip and you wouldn't know that you weren't floating 200 years ago. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. Now, just want to show you something. This is about a three minute film clip. This is the Jack's Fork River. This is my favorite river in the Ozarks. I have floated this river probably six or seven times. Uh, no teacher friend of mine, uh, when I was still working and young, uh, used to pack our canoe with about three days worth of supplies. And we would take off and we would float down a river and camp at night and uh, cook breakfast in the morning and tell lies and just have a really good time. Well, the Jack's Fork was my favorite river. I absolutely love floating the Jack's Fork. And I found this little about three minute video. Uh, it's an advertisement, but I think it kind of gives you an idea of what the Ozarks look like in its pristine shape. So let's look at this and see what it looks like.
Okay. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. That always brings every time I look at that, it brings back fond memories to me because I, I floated that river, like I said, five or six times. And it's just, it's one of the most beautiful sites that I've ever been on. It's just a beautiful river. Now, the reason that the Jack's Fork and the current and the Buffalo were protected was because, as I mentioned, during the uh, 1940s and 50s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer, Engineer just went on a tear building dams. And there's a reason for that. Number one, um, the Ozarks was one of the last areas in the United States probably to have electrification. Uh, there was also a, a desire to control the floods because these rivers flooded constantly. Some of them, like the White River and the Osage River, uh, particularly, were, were very frequently flooding. And on top of that, uh, the Army Corps engineers needed something to do. It just so happens that we have one of the biggest Army installations in the United States located in the Ozarks at Fort Leonard Wood, outside of uh, Waynesville, Missouri. And uh, the Army Corps of Engineers are based out of Waynesville, so it's only kind of uh, Fort Leonard Wood, so it's only kind of natural that they would learn how to uh, do these things here in the Ozarks. And they went on a tear damming. Uh, the first dam to be built in the Ozarks wasn't built by the Army Corps of Engineers. It was actually built on the White River by a, uh, a company, an electric company, an early electric company to provide electrification for that part of the Ozarks. And then the next one built was Bagnell Dam. And it was also a privately built dam by the uh, electric company, which now is called the Ameren Electric Company, which primarily provides electricity to the huge metropolis of St. Louis. And at that time, St. Louis was one of the biggest cities in the United States. Uh, but between the 1940s through the 1960s, the Army Corps engineers built six dams across the White River and its tributaries provide flood relief, hydroelectricity, and also tourism. Now, not everybody was a big fan of these dams. I'm gonna tell you right now, I can remember my dad who uh, was, he would rather fish than eat. You know, he was one of these people that his life revolved around fishing. Uh, and he used to go on the White River and fish and I remember when they were building Table Rock Dam in the 50s. I was just a, a young boy then. Boy, I mean, I'm not going to tell you everything he said, but he only referred to that dam as that damn dam. You know, he just hated that dam. But of course, uh, it has since provided electricity. It's provided flood relief and, and also was a big contributor to the huge tourist industry in the state of Missouri. So in 1941, the Army Corps engineers built the North Fork Dam across the North Fork River. Uh, they built the, the uh, Clearwater Dam across the Black River. These were both pretty small dams. Then they built a really big dam across the White River, the southern part. I'll show you uh, these in a minute. Uh, the Bull Shoals Dam, 1958, they completed the Table Rock Dam also on the White River, uh, Greer's Ferry, on the little Red River, which flows into the White, and the Beaver Dam, also on the White River. These six dams were built primarily on tributaries or uh, parts of the White River. They also built dams across the Osage River. Uh, they, built th they built three of them. The Pomnatera River uh, was dammed in 1961. The Stockton uh, Dam was built across the Sac River, which flows into the Osage. And they also built the Truman Dam. That was really the last one they built because frankly, they didn't have a very good success with it. And uh, since that time, uh, they've not built any more dams in the Ozarks, uh, which is quite fine. I think probably they've done enough of it. Uh, by the way, interesting picture here. This is a picture of a family vis visiting that first dam, the Power Site Dam, which was built at Forsyth, Missouri. Uh, and this it was built in 1911. This picture would have been taken probably, I'm going to say 1917, 18, 19, somewhere in that area. The reason I know that is because that is my grandmother. That is my Uncle Billy and my Aunt Anna, who I never knew. They both died in childhood, uh, which was pretty common back in those days. 
That is my grandmother's sister. And that is my dad. You know, looking over his shoulder, you can almost tell he's a, he was a troublemaker from the beginning. Uh, no, he was a good guy, but he, uh, he was, he was a pretty honorary character uh, in his youth, I think. So uh, anyway, this is a picture I thought I'd show and it, it, they're sitting on the, on the edge of the power site dam there. And, uh, you know, what a remarkable picture to have. This is some of those dams. This is the Bagnell Dam. It's huge. And uh, it created the Lake of the Ozarks. The Lake of the Ozarks is the largest man-made lake in the United States, if you don't know it. Uh, this is Table Rock Dam, which uh, down around Branson. This is the Bull Shoals Dam, which is uh, a little bit uh, east and south of Branson. And this is the Norfolk Dam across the Norfolk River, uh, created Norfolk Lake. Now, all these rivers are there primarily because of the springs. There are so many springs in the Ozarks, I can't even begin to tell you how many there are. In fact, the case, they have the arm, the uh, United, the Missouri State Conservation Commission has listed at least 1,100 springs in the Ozarks. Now, probably half of those are pretty small, but 600 of them are really a pretty significant size. Now, if you don't know, a spring is formed when surface water seeps through the limestone bedrock, and the Ozarks is limestone bedrock, trapped under underground rivers, and then eventually it flows up through caves or sinkholes or something forming springs. Uh, some, of them, some of these springs in the Ozarks are amongst the largest in the world. Uh, it's estimated that the largest of the springs in the Ozarks, a place called Big Spring, you know, we're not very imaginative when we name these things, uh, could supply all the water needs for New York City. I wanna repeat that, Big Spring, located down around Van Buren, Missouri, could supply all the water needs for New York City. New York City would never have to worry about having water if they had Big Spring. 15 of these, it flow in excess of 24 million gallons a day. Four of them flow in excess of 100 million gallons a day. And get this, Big Spring at its major peak they measured it one year when there was that flood stage, over a billion gallons of water in a single day came out of Big Springs. That's how big these things are. This is a map showing you the location of these 1100 springs. And you can see this is Greene County. This is where I'm situated. You can see how many springs are in Greene County. Some of the bigger ones are down here in this area through here. But Greene County is just has tremendous amounts of springs. Again, about a short minute clip. This is big springs. This will give you an idea of just how big this thing is. Just, just listen to it and listen to the water. And it flows like this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This was just normal flow. It flows a lot bigger than this during heavy rain.
Okay, I think you can get an idea of how big this thing is. Now, like I said, that's the biggest. There's some others that are pretty good size. There's Greer Springs, there's the Blue Spring, and that's probably what most springs look like. You know, uh, most of them don't flow out like big springs across rock and make a lot of noise. Most of them just come out from deep underground and form pools and just have rivers flowing out. This is my personal favorite spring. This is Bennett Spring. Uh, it's stocked by trout by the Missouri State Conservation Commission. And you can go trout fishing there every day. And uh, that was my one of my favorite pastimes after I retired was uh, fly fishing with another one of my teacher friends. And uh, unfortunately, the old knees don't much allow me to do that anymore. But I still have a lot of fond memories of trout fishing on Bennett Spring. Uh, so these springs had a lot of use. Uh, Obviously, they supplied water. You didn't have to worry about water if you if you will settle by a spring. They obviously were used to power grist mills to grind corn and meal. Uh, some of them were saline springs, and so they provided salt. Some of them had certain minerals in them, uh, and they thought they were healing waters. Uh, there's one up around El Dorado Springs, which has a tremendous amount of sulfur. And you talk about stinking. It stinks to high heaven, but there was a whole thing in the 1800s, early 1900s, where people flocked to El Dorado Springs to take the waters for healing purposes. Uh, so these mineral waters just became really big. Eureka Springs in Northwest Arkansas was one of the biggest, along with Excelsior Springs, El Dorado Springs, and Magnetic Springs. Now, as a result, the Ozarks, has a lot of old mills and uh, you can spend a whole day touring mills in the Ozarks. You can probably spend two or three days, but you can spend one day, get up in the morning and travel around in a couple of counties and you can see a whole lot of really beautiful old restored mills. This is probably one of my favorites. This is Hodgkin's Mill, uh, located on the Hodgkin Spring. And uh, that's the uh, photo I used for the introduction. Uh, this is Alley Springs, located on the Jacks Fork River. It's been preserved uh, and restored by the National Park Service. This is the old dot mill. It's not as well preserved, but it kind of gives you an idea of what the, the mills would have looked like probably in their pristine when they were really built. By the way, if you were with me last year, you might remember that one of my great great grandfathers Jesse Ballard James was the first millwright of the old dot mill. And uh, when I go there and I kind of walk around it, I just can't help but think of him a little bit. And then there's Rock Bridge Mill on Bryant, Bryant Creek, which flows into uh, the Norfolk River. And uh, it's, a, it's a big source of uh, you know, trout fishing as well. Now, as a result of this, I told you they built big healing water things around some of these mineralized springs. One of the biggest locations was Eureka Springs, which is a big tourist place today. And one of the old hotels, there's several of them, but one of the best hotels that they preserved is the Crescent Hotel, setting up on a bluff uh, at Eureka Springs. And you can still go there. It's been restored, an old Victorian hotel. And you can vacation there and you can kind of close your eyes and almost pretend you're back 120, 130, 40 years ago. Uh, by the way, it's also supposedly one of the most haunted places in America. Uh, they have one particular room, I think it's room 206, that supposedly is one of the most haunted places in America. I don't necessarily believe that because I spent a night there. My wife and I decided one week we were gonna go down and spend the weekend at Eureka Springs and we went to the Crescent Hotel and my wife didn't know it, but I requested the haunted room and we spent a, uh, a night there in a haunted room. Didn't hear a thing. Okay, so next week, we're going to look at the land. This week, we looked at the water. We're going to look at the land next week. What makes the Ozarks land? Uh, it's not quite as majestic as the water is. So I appreciate you being with me today. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to do another couple of weeks talking about the resources of the Ozarks, and then we're going to get in 
to the Indian history of the Ozarks, the Native American uh, history, because it's really rich and deep in Native American lore. So thank you for being with me. I hope you had a good time and I hope you've learned something and we'll see you next week. Very good, very good.